Hello everybody and many thanks for tuning in to listen to this presentation today. Uh, my name is Brian Sloan and I work for the Centre for Community Archaeology based at Queen's University in Belfast. I'm going to talk uh, very briefly today over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so about a recent community-based investigation that we carried out at New Mills in County Tyrone. Uh, this project was carried out in association with the Loch Ness Partnership and was funded through the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Mid Ulster Council. The investigation itself uh, involved the excavation of two trenches at the site of a mill that lies just to the to the outskirts of the village of New Mills. Um, it's the first time that a mill structure has actually been looked at archaeologically and it was, a, it was a very worthwhile project even though we were only there for a very short period of time the excavation was, uh, was carried out over a period of two weeks in August 2021. As I say, it, it was a very uh, worthwhile archaeological project because it's the first time these mill structures have actually been looked at archaeologically. But on a personal note, it was also the first uh, community project that we've carried out involving volunteers and school children uh, since uh, COVID restrictions have been eased and it's just fantastic to be back at it. So New Mills itself lies to the immediate northwest of Coal Island, County Tyrone, and it's an area of a very uh, great importance when we consider the industrial landscape of the north of Ireland, especially in the post-medieval period. Uh, New Mills itself, uh, you, can, you can gather from the name of the village, uh, is its location for a number of mills of all different functions, but as well of uh, the great canals and the aqueducts associated um, with the industrialization of this landscape in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the site itself is located just to the south of the centre of the town of New Mills, in between the Brackenville Road and the Farlock Road. And if we if we look at uh, an overhead of the site, this is the field that is actually in. It's located very adjacent to um, the Torrent River, and uh, we know that the Torrent River was actually adjusted further on up uh, towards the town of New Mills uh, by a mill base and they were using that water to actually power the mill itself. Uh, the site is located uh, right beside uh, a, quite a fine 18th century aqueduct that unfortunately at the minute is covered in, in trees and foliage but there, there is talks about trying to get it exposed and, and presented better to the public. Um, as well there was a, a mighty fine water treatment works located uh, just to the east of where we were digging and this provided a lovely sort of backdrop especially in the warm weather that we were getting in August. So the site is depicted on all the editions of the Orton Survey uh, maps. Uh, this is an image from the first edition map dating to the 1830s and you can see that the, the mill itself is described as a spade manufactory given us the function of the structure. This map is also very important as it's given an idea about the other sites of industrial importance in the general vicinity of the mill, including the 18th century aqueduct, uh, mill dam, number of bleach mills and number of reservoirs as well. So it's given us a picture of, a, of how industrial, uh, industrial this landscape would have looked, certainly by the 1830s. Um, the site is described as spade manufactory all through the 19th century until we get to the third the third edition revision map of uh, around about 1900 where you can see that the, the mill is described as uh, as a dairy. Uh, of note uh, we can see the, the development of the landscape further especially the enclosing of the field systems around New Mills Dairy but as well that the, the aqueduct is now described as disused. So the Orton Survey memoirs associated with the uh, with the mapping in the eighteen thirties describes two spade mills in the area. Uh, the one that we're interested in was owned by Mr. Garrity. Um, the details of the spade mills supplied all the neighbouring markets and occasionally sent a cargo of spades and shovels and plow irons to America. So as well, you can be kind of building up this image that is a very industrious place. You know, they're they're producing an awful lot, an awful lot of material out of these two spade mills. The Griffiths evaluation of 1860 and subsequent revisions uh, provide even more detail about the occupiers and the buildings themselves. 
They are frequently described as dilapidated, repaired, old, ruins, etc. And this suggests constant use and modification or repair was being carried out. It also describes the role of the mill changing from spade manufacturing, corn mill, uh, kiln, sawmill, and finally the creamery. And this, this is uh, supporting the cartographic evidence of the site itself. The houses associated with the mill were known as Creamery Row, and this reflects the site's later history, although undoubtedly uh, they were present uh, during the earlier uh, periods of uh, activity at the mill. Uh, the last inhabitant, Mr Jimmy Fullen, vacated the site in the, early in the mid 1970s, and indeed one of our volunteers during the investigation, uh, James Walsh, can remember attending Cayley's at Creamery Row in the early 1970s. The site uh, then lay vacant for another decade or so and gradually came into disrepair uh, until a major fire at the site occurred in the mid 1980s and uh, subsequently the mill and creamery row were demolished and the site reverted back into the green field. Um, if we look at the houses themselves, uh, they were they were relatively rudimentary. There was no back doors. There's uh, they had stone and tile floors. They had an outside toilet that ran straight into the river torrent. But despite this, they they were a focal point of the community, and especially during the time of the mill um, being being a creamery, it certainly was a focus point for for farmers from the district coming here. Um, and would to deposit their milk and their cream. If we look at the history of the area written in 1993, we see the author stating that the houses have been pulled down and the giant water wheel has been removed, so that now nothing remains of the historic part of New Mills. And I think this is quite important because this shows the kind of the community that Creamery Road provided for the new of the wider New Mills community. And despite the fact that they weren't necessarily penthouse apartments. They, they served their purpose as being a community focus and you know this it was just a perfect place to carry out a community based investigation. So the investigation started in August 2021 and uh, involved the excavation of two trenches as you can see here trench one and trench two. Trench one was uh, designed to look at the social aspect of, of the site and, and was uh, focused on Creamery Row itself, uh, whereas Trench 2 was uh, located further to the northwest in an area we believe that would be bang in the middle of the mill part, in, in the middle of the industrial site. So this end of investigation, even though it was only two weeks long, uh, tried to try assess the, the potential of the site archaeologically, but as well investigate uh, the social as well as the industrial aspects of the history of the site. The results of the excavation in Trench 1 were, were relatively mixed and um, possibly the, big, the biggest thing coming out of it was that the demolition in the 1980s seemed to be quite thorough with little uh, structural evidence of uh, Crinder Row actually, actually coming to light. Um, if we look at the section picture of Trench 1, just this, bit, this image here, uh, where you can see the, the kind of orange and the black lines. We're, we're interpreting that as levelling up deposits for the floor of one of the structures associated with Creamery Row. With, uh, on the right hand side of the picture where we see this, the large stones and it's voided and there's slides of mortar and all through it. Uh, that's, a, that's interpreted as a demolition deposit. So that, that's basically the stuff that they, they haven't taken away and it's just been leveled out and you can actually see in the section itself where this little uh, red dash line is that's that you can almost imagine that's the digger bucket digging into the side of it so it is very well uh, demolished there is a caveat to this in that we um we were only digging for the two weeks and so there's only so much we can actually investigate in such a small hole as well but excavation stopped once we reached this, uh, what we interpret as a demolition deposit. And you see it's, it's large stones and mortar and, and fragments of brick and all through that. Despite the uh, absence of structural evidence associated with Creamery Road, the material culture associated with the inhabitants who lived here uh, was, was quite big. We got uh, very numerous shards of pottery, of glass. We got fragments of clay tobacco pipe and 
This is an image of two of our undergraduate students uh, who very kindly gave up their spare time to come and give us a hand during, during the excavation and we're very appreciative of it. On the left we have Gemma Shawcross who is a level 2 student and on the right in the mighty fine hat we have uh, Ryan Montgomery who is a level 3 student and they are in the process of excavating uh, an iron fire grate which was one of the kind of iconic artifacts found uh, during the excavation of Trench 1. Uh, this artifact proved very popular with uh, with people who were coming down to visit the site because um, you know everybody knows the hearth is the centre point of the house itself and people could imagine you know people on a cold winter's night sitting around this hearth getting warmth maybe have a bit of crack having we smoke in the tobacco pipes or whatever. Um, so, as I say, Trench 1 produced little in way of uh, structural evidence, but again that might be due to the, the very small time period that we actually had to dig it. Um, but there is potential there, uh, the artifacts are there, and who knows what lies underneath that rubble deposit, whether there are the remains of walls or whether there are the remains of four floors, whatever, we don't know. That will have to remain for another time. Trench 3 was excavated to the northwest of Trench 1 and was located to investigate the industrial aspect of the site and was positioned in an area we believe would be would be in the middle of the mill complex itself. Um, as well as this, uh, because this summer was so dry and so warm, there were distinct uh, parch marks on the ground, so we located the trench over what we believed would be uh, the intersection of two walls. Um, we weren't really disappointed with with the results of trench two. In fact, it showed uh, quite a high degree of uh, of survival of archaeological features and deposits. Once we had removed the rubble from the trench, the rubble associated with the 1980s demolition, we came across uh, a number of walls, intersecting walls, as well as a fine tiled floor that you can see on the left hand side of this image here. Um, these tiles are actually quite interesting and date uh, this level of archaeology quite, quite closely within a period of 10 years, uh, due to the fact that the some of them are actually stamped with uh, D. Devlin, Ulster Works, Cool Island. And this, this, uh, dates, uh, this dates this deposit really to the period of uh, 1874 to around about 1884. Now the reason we can be so confident in this dating is that uh, the Belfast Newsletter uh, carries an advert in 1874 saying that a D. Devlin had set up uh, tile works in Cool Island in County Tyrone and was advertising his wares. Um, also in the Belfast Newsletter in 1884 it says that the tile works have gone out of business and that he was selling off all his stock. So if we assume that these tiles were laid in this period of, of D. Devlin manufacturing these tiles it would, it would date this floor deposit to the period between 1874 and 1884. Uh, this, according to the uh, Griffiths uh, valuation of the site, this uh, places the activity of the mill itself as a, as a corn mill and kiln, um, which is which is quite interesting. So we've gone beyond the earlier history of it being a spade manufactory, and um, we're in that kind of inter intervening period between the spade manufactory and the creamery. And um, this uh, this phase of activity was also. Uh, exhibited a number of modifications to the structures and uh, the wall going up the middle of the trench that the, that the red and white ranging pole is on is a later addition and I think it's associated with the laying down of this tile floor but as well there were certain other aspects of of the site there, there was like a door blocked up as well uh, which shows a, a modification of an earlier phase of activity on the site so following the recording of this tile floor, it was then lifted just to see what was surviving underneath. Uh, these tiles were retained and uh, what we're going to do, we, uh, we, um, we're going to return one to the landowner and one to the local primary school who helped us out uh, throughout the excavation as well, just as a little memento uh, of, of their time and of their experience at New Mills. When we lifted this tile floor, we came across uh, a very 
thick deposit of of very very charred black and um, clay almost uh, that was filled with fragments of iron and fragments of iron slag and this revealed uh, a sort of a domed deposit of 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 clay and, and what we can only say is redeposited boulder clay that had large uh, flat flagstones set into the surface now bear in mind that the wall through the top of this image is actually later it's associated with the 1874 um, period of use of the site so we need to kind of forget about that and let that go and um, what this sort of domed uh, deposit of clay represents i'm not too sure but the presence of the flat flagstones in it is quite interesting and i kind of like to think that maybe it's associated with some sort of machinery that was there in an early period of history of the site maybe associated with the with the spade mill itself and maybe it, it was it was meant to house and um, maybe like a something to do with a furnace or maybe something to do like a power hammer or something like that some sort of industrial equipment that might have utilized the clay to dampen out the noise maybe the black deposit itself as i say was filled with um with with metal artifacts and metal slag but a couple of uh, small finds that that proved quite interesting and that also date this deposit very well as you see this is this is the uh, archaeologist Gemma Shawcross and she's holding up some of the, the smaller finer finds that are actually recovered from this deposit which included um, a clay tobacco uh, pipe bowl, a lovely uh, clay marble or clay bottle stopper and as well as a very fine little button. Now the button's quite interesting, I haven't got down to the very uh, the background of the button yet but a very similar one was found by Irish Archaeological Consultancy in their recent excavations in Dublin Castle uh, dating to the, the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the clay pipe bowl has been looked at by our our, our resident uh, clay pipe specialist Rory O'Boyle and has stated, he has stated that it dates to the period 18, or 1780 to 1840. So if we take a mean sort of a median date of that of around about 1800 to 1810 this dates um, this dates this deposit very well and would suggest certainly that the clay dome as well as the black deposit is associated with this with the history of the site when it was the spade mill. Um, so it's just an indication to show that there are lots of stuff here still to find. There, there's a story you know we only excavated very very small trenches but it's an indication that there is a story just waiting to be revealed on the site. Uh, another aspect or one of the features that was encountered, so we're looking towards the south at the minute, was this um, mortared, uh, um, three courses of mortared angular stone. And we were kind of wrecking our brains to, uh, to, what, uh, to try and interpret what this might actually be. And it was it was our one of our volunteers, James Walsh, who's a who's a local fountain of knowledge when it comes to all things industrial, um, came out with the idea that this is actually represent one side of the mill race that came from New Mills Town further on to the to the west, and would have uh, would have uh, come down the back of the mill structure and then powered uh, the big water wheel itself. And if we look at the first edition map. We can actually see just highlighted here in blue where the mill race will come down the slope into the back of the mill structure will power the water wheel and will actually come out and flow in to the river current itself and we cast our mind back to the the black and white photograph we saw off of primary row and of the mill structure itself and that little that little outhouse that was sitting near the river that was actually their toilet and um, it seems quite reasonable that they were using the the off flow of the mill race to wash everything from that outhouse into the river tart itself. So the project was an outstanding success not just uh, from an archaeological uh, standing whereby it was the first mill that was archaeologically excavated in, in the north of Ireland certainly in the island of Ireland but also for the public engagement over the two weeks. Um, over the two weeks we had in the region of of 50 volunteers, uh, both adults and, and school kids taking part in the excavation, but also well over 80 visitors just coming down uh, just to see what the crack was and just have a chat and see how the excavation was progressing. 
as I said before, this is uh, the first of our community community based excavations that we've carried out since uh, the COVID restrictions were lifted. Um, we didn't carry out any of these in 2020 or indeed up and up um, for the majority of 2021. And it was just great to be back uh, engaging with the public and having interested people coming out and giving us a hand in excavation and just uh, giving us the benefit of their local knowledge as well, which is so beneficial when you're coming in to dig such a site as well. And just to be part of that community, albeit for two weeks, just to be a part of that community was fantastic. But it's not just the adult volunteers really that this story is about, really about the kids who came out to, to help us excavate as well. And we were fortunate that uh, the local primary school, New Mills Primary School, were carrying out uh, um, a summer scheme at the same time. And the kids came down to give us a hand. And you know, like the kids have had hard enough last 18 months or so, you know, with, uh, with carrying out their school activities over Zoom and over Teams meetings as well. So even just to get the teachers were telling us, even just to get them out into the fresh air and get them getting muddy and having a bit of crack was so beneficial, especially for their own mental health. And it was great for us as well um, to be to be a part of that. And hopefully they'll remember their time with us excavating for many years to come. Um, to finish off, I've just got a number of acknowledgements I'd like to make. Um, for everybody who really has made this project an outstanding success, uh, Keith Beatty, all the folks in Loch Ney Landscape Partnership and to the National Heritage Lottery Fund and Mid-Ulster Council for actually funding the investigation. Um, the utmost gratitude goes to, to all these people, uh, without which the, the project would never even have happened in the first place. Uh, the staff and the pupils in New Mill Primary School as well as the, the landowner, Michael Bale, for facilitating the excavation and everybody who took part and, vi part and visit us during the two weeks. Um, you are the focus of these projects and thank you very much for showing your interest and your enthusiasm in the, in the investigation. Uh, Ryan and Gemma, uh, you really went above and beyond all expectations and, and we couldn't have got as much done uh, without your presence there, so thank you very much. And the last we note really goes to James Walsh, um, who for his, for his superb local knowledge and for really keeping the crack going over the two weeks and ultimately for helping to fix Ryan's car that uh, broke down on the very last day. Thank you very much, everybody.